Hi everybody, Fury here. We're going to talk about an issue from the Enlightenment uh, called reputation, or today you might call it the gaze. Um, the idea of how much do we pay attention to what culture, society, uh, parents say about how we should act, what we should think, how we should dress. Um, this was actually a really important issue in the Enlightenment. And um, if I were to ask you, you know, do you pay attention to cultural expectations and should you pay attention to cultural expectations? Uh, today, the question would probably be very easy to answer. People would just say, look, I know what I want to do, or at least I know that I should be able to determine my own future, my own identity, uh, regardless of what society expects of me. Uh, but in the 18th century, writers like Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, who's known as the fo founder of modern feminism, even though um, there is no feminism at that time, she did write a book called The Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Um, and, but she was a very powerful writer in these kinds of issues. She talked about women in this book and the effect of expectations on women, because of course women um, at that time were much more uh, under the pressure of cultural expectations. Uh, than men were. Um, and this has remained an important issue. Uh, so when Wollstonecraft look at, looks at it, the issue opens up in a lot of interesting ways that you might not expect. And so the way to really break it down and go deep into it is to look at how she looks at the issue, first of all, from the point of view of politics and society in general. Is it good to have cultural expectations, social expectations of behavior, dress, um, speech, very important, the idea of speech, how much should speech be, um, you know, kind of m controlled by expectation. So we're going to, I'm going to share the screen here and we're going to go back to, um, to some early thinkers. And so here we're going to talk about uh, Thomas Hobbes. So this is a long time before Wollstonecraft. Thomas Hobbes uh, was a theorist, um, a political theorist and had a very dim view of the original nature of mankind. And then we're gonna talk about um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is uh, getting closer to Wollstonecraft. He's mid 1700s, and he um, has a lot to say about reputation and cultural expectations, among a lot of other things. And then of course, uh, there is Mary Wollstonecraft. And this is, uh, in a way, I'm gonna follow uh, the thinking on this issue of reputation through these three two writers and then end up with what Wollstonecraft says. Uh, so here is uh, Thomas Hobbes's famous Leviathan. Uh, it's a book that was written in an incredibly harrowing time. It was a civil war. The, the king had been executed. Hobbes was in general a monarchist, although people have said uh, when Hobbes says that we need a powerful authority figure, uh, he kept it purposely vague. Uh, because at that time there was a, essentially a dictator, a guy called Oliver Cromwell. Uh, Thomas Hobbes was in exile at the time, uh, but he wrote this book basically saying, look, by nature, human beings are cruel, competitive. Uh, if you don't have a powerful authority figure, you're, you're going to have chaos, which is, you know, you can understand at his time there was chaos. And uh, you can understand why he uh, would want to say that. So Hobbes um, creates, you know, there's a lot of famous sayings from Hobbes, like uh, uh, in nature, life is nasty, brutish, and short. It's the war of all against all. And this is why you need a strong authority figure to bring law and order into society. Sounds familiar, right? Now, in the middle of this, uh, Hobbes does what a lot of philosophers do, and he goes back to the what they call the state of nature. So the state of nature would be like, how were people originally? If he can establish that people are by nature violent, competitive, etc., then he can easily say uh, the solution to this has to be the ultimate solution, because if we're by nature violent, it's not caused by culture, then the government that takes care of that um, would be exactly the right government now and forever, right? It's, it's a very powerful argument. And so I'm going to take a piece that has to do specifically with reputation. We're talking about the importance of cultural expectations. Seems like a long way off from my first question, but actually it's, uh, it's a theme that a lot of writers talked about that actually relates in many ways to, um, you know, other issues like the ones in Wollstonecraft. So here we have uh, here he has his 
famous statement from chapter 13 of Leviathan, so that in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel, competition, diffidence, and glory. So that third one is the one. He calls it glory. Uh, when he expands on it, you'll see that he's talking about reputation. Uh, the first maketh man invade for gain, right? So we compete with each other naturally and we invade other people, uh, attack other people so we can get with their stuff. Second, for safety, we might attack other people preemptively uh, to guard ourselves, right? And the third for reputation. And this is the important thing here. We're going to skip over to the third for trifles as a word, a smile, a different opinion, any other sign of undervalue. So this is a very masculine type of idea that if you insult my honor, if you insult my, my name, uh, I'm going to attack you, right? And so Hobbes puts this as fundamental to our nature, right? So chapter 13 and Thomas Hobbes. Now we'll go forward. There's a lot to say on this, but we'll go forward about 100 years to Rousseau. And here is um, Rousseau in uh, his second discourse called the Discourse on Inequality. And in this discourse, he asks some good questions. How does inequality begin? And Rousseau has some very radical answers to this. He talks about things like property. You know, property is what creates everything else. All the other problems of humanity are created by property. So it appears to be a very radical point of view. Everything else that we do that's bad, uh, attack each other, blame each other, have hierarchies, uh, nepotism, corruption, um, you know, the inequality between the sexes, as he puts it. Uh, all of this comes from um, the kind of break with a, a very benevolent nature. So Rousseau's nature is a very benevolent one and everything else that's bad is created by culture, right? Whereas Hobbes's nature is a very aggressive one and we need a very oppressive authoritarian uh, political system to, to keep us in line. But when, what, when uh, Rousseau gets to reputation, like how do we start out caring what people look like, how they act, how they talk? Because obviously, if you're gonna have a benevolent nature, uh, you, you shouldn't be caring about, you shouldn't be stressing out you should, about what people think of you. You should just do what you do, right? And uh, so he, he says uh, here, uh, it's kind of small, but um, he says it, it kind of starts, first of all, when people start gathering in groups, uh, property has been established. This is already the first kind of problem. And um, in these groups, people grew accustomed to gather in front of their huts or around their large tree. Song and dance, true children of love and leisure become the amusement or rather the occupation of idle men and women who had flocked together. So this is very typical Rousseau. He starts sounding like song and music are lovely and they're wonderful. They're the perfect amusements for lazy people. So this is a classic Rousseau way of writing where he kind of sucker punches you. You're following, following, and then he says, and that's stupid, right? And he loves doing that. But okay, basically he's saying that people gather around their huts, usually they're young people, they sing, they dance. Um, uh, and then each one began to look at the others and uh, to want to be looked at himself and public esteem had a value. The one who sang or danced the best, the handsomest, the strongest, the most adroit, the most eloquent became the most highly, highly regarded. So this is how reputation begins. This is how this love of being loved, this love of, of, of being seen as great to in the eyes of other people, right? And this is Hobbes's third principle. And Rousseau is very purposely evoking Hobbes here. It doesn't seem to be, seems to be talking about something completely randomly different. Uh, but this is exactly what he's doing because Rousseau's whole principle in um, his first discourse, his second discourse, the foundations of his philosophy on the state of nature is that um, everything that Hobbes says that is natural to us, the na natural competition, right? And even today, people might say, well, we're naturally competitive as human beings, right? Everything, those are all a result of culture. Culture has made us that way. Culture has corrupted us, right? This is why Rousseau is famous for the, for the noble savage idea. So, so, so reputation is one of those things. It's very damaging. And because it's damaging because people aren't what they truly are. 
uh, people will even kill each other in order to maintain their reputation, or at least they'll oppress each other. It creates the differences in, in, uh, in between genders. Um, you know, Rousseau, although he himself was highly patriarchal, as Wollstonecraft uh, exposed, uh, he thought that in the state of nature, men and women were much more equal, right? Um, in, in, in even in abilities and everything. So, so this is this is Rousseau, and so Rousseau, you know, we're going from Hobbes, where reputation is natural to us, and we are willing to kill people and attack people to protect our reputation if we're insulted. And then we get to Rousseau. Yes, he agrees, but this is not natural to us. This is created by culture, and therefore we have to get rid of the idea of reputation, right? Or at least that's what it seems to be. We, when we go back deep into Rousseau, we'll see he has a very complex answer to this. But this is the second step. Uh, now we go to Wollstonecraft. Now, in Wollstonecraft, she has this two-step answer to the question of reputation. And it seems to be very local, right? So the question would be, are women's issues human issues, right? And the book is completely about women and what happens to women when they are um, kind of pressured in different ways. It's a long book with many, many uh, interesting points. Uh, and this is just one of them. But the question still, you might say, relates to everyone. Because it's about women, it's really about everyone, right? And so he, she starts talking in a very kind of philosophical way about this idea of reputation. And she says, I mean, therefore, to infer that society is not properly organized, which does not compel men and women to discharge their respective duties. Okay. So you would expect her to say, um, women should not worry so much about how they look. They should be more what's going on on the inside, right? As Hamlet says, I know not seems, right? And he talks about how his inside is, is the key, is the important thing. And I would bring up Hamlet, even though it's 200 years before this, because they've all read Hamlet. They're all very familiar with this concept of the inside and the outside of human beings, right? Uh, but so you would expect her to say, look, um, women, you know, they're prisoners of appearance, right? Especially in her time, uh, women were prisoners of appearance. Uh, the girdles, the hairstyle. This is why she purposely, you look at this painting here, she has her hair all messed up. She's reading a book. It's not very feminine. Um, you know, her, her gown is like kind of ungirdled, you know, and for that time, that painting was kind of, kind of intense. Let me just go back here to what she, what, how powerful this painting was in terms of showing a truly liberated intellectual woman, right? Um, so, you know, the hair is kind of held up by this ribbon. There's even a quill in the back. You see, there's like a little feather in the back to mean that she's a writer. She's not, she's not playing the clavichord, you know, or doing little cotillions. She's writing, she's reading, she's thinking, she's staring right at you uh, boldly. So Wollstonecraft, you might expect her to say, look, this is what should happen. Women should, you know, go right ahead. And she even says of herself, you know, I just go ahead and do what I want. Uh, which is very interesting. She actually says, I'm, you know, but I'm not, but she says, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about women in general, right? We could argue about why, why that's important for her to do. So let's read again her surprising sentence. I mean, therefore, to infer that society is not properly organized, which does not compel men and women to discharge their respective duties by making it the only way to acquire the countenance from their fellow creatures. Right? So the only way to get countenance, which is an 18th century word that could mean reputation in some cases, sometimes it means facial expression. The only way to get a good reputation in Wollstonecraft's ideal society is to be a good person, is to fulfill your duties to other people, right? Because to her, that was one of the highest virtues is to be good to your, to your community. And she was, in her own personal life, she was great. Uh, she saved her sister from a terrible marriage by kidnapping her own sister. She uh, used her considerable amount of money for her, for a woman of that time, to uh, help one of her brothers get uh, a good career. She helped uh, orphan girls. She even put one up in her house. So she believes that helping other people is uh, the highest virtue. I don't know what you believe. What is the highest virtue? What do you consider the highest value of your life, right? So... She says, but that's how people should get good reputation for that, not for how beautiful they are, 
not for how eloquent they are, right, and things like that. So then we go deeper into it, and this is from the original edition of, of Rights of Woman, um, just going into this beautiful typography. I don't know what you think, whether the typography makes it better, right, makes it more interesting. Or, uh, I, I love it. You know, there's a kind of weird thing going on with the Fs. Uh, you see how society looks like to be spelled with an F, but really it's an S, but okay. Now, um, here she, we're looking at it again. And we're looking at it in the original typography. And she says, the respect consequently, which is paid to wealth and mere personal charms is a true Northeast blast that blights the tender blossoms of affection and virtue. So there you have it. Um, she's comparing having a reputation for doing good things with a reputation for um, uh, wealth, personal charms. She seems to be on Rousseau's side, but we're gonna have to go deeper into rights of women to see where she departs from Rousseau. But the main principle here is she's not out for removing cultural expectations. She's out for saying those expectations should be reformed so that what people are famous for is to be good people. And to some degree, we can say our culture does value those things more than wealth or beauty and, and things like that. So to the degree that Wollstonecraft and people like Wollstonecraft have been um, successful in doing that, and this is why this question of the founder of modern feminism maybe needs to be broadened. Um, to that extent, we could go back and say, look, this is one of the people that that fought for this, you know, early in these uh, revolutionary times. This is written around the time of the French and American Revolution. So that's the issue of reputation. But I'm going to add a little coda to this lecture. You can stop now if you want, or you can watch the next part where I'll go on to talk about um, specifically where that shows up in another writer that was really important to her time, the writer called John Milton, who wrote about the fall of Satan and uh, made Satan look quite attractive as a character. Wollstonecraft was fascinated with Milton. Milton is the first writer she talks about specifically uh, in Rights of Women. There's a lot to talk about there, but I'm gonna go back to this question of appearance and this very puzzling and beautiful and complicated thing that he does with the issue of appearance in uh, Paradise Lost. So this is one of the great images from Paradise Lost. And here is the first time Adam and Eve appear in Paradise Lost. It's very deep in the book. It's book four uh, because Milton has dealt with a lot of other things. Uh, the, the angels have fallen. Satan has become the, the leader of the fallen angels. Um, he turns out to be a very uh, stout, powerful, uh, wise, I wouldn't say wise, but clever leader. And for some reason, Satan is very attractive in, in uh, Paradise Lost. I mean, Satan, right? The most evil creature that ever lived in the Christian uh, cosmography. Um, but remember, Milton himself, I don't know if you know this, why would Milton make Satan so attractive? I mean, Milton himself is a Christian, he's a Puritan, right? Well, he didn't call himself a Puritan, that was actually an insult, but you know, he's a, he's a very devout Protestant Christian. So now Milton was on the other side of Hobbes. Hobbes worked for the king, the son of the king who had been killed and was in exile. Milton worked for Cromwell, who was basically the leader of a kingless country, but he's essentially a dictator. Um, so the rebel would be Cromwell, right? Or would be one of the people that attacked the king. But the funny thing is that this book, Paradise Lost, was also popular after the king came back after Charles II came back in 1660 and remained popular all the way through the 17th and 18th century. So the position of Satan is very puzzling. Is he really um, terrible because he tries to attack an absolutist king, right? Because Satan attacks God and that's the ultimate absolutist king. Uh, but at the same time, he should make Satan into quite a terrible figure. So anyway, Wollstonecraft, when she looks at Milton, is very interested in the way that Milton uh, sets up Adam and Eve. But the interesting thing is that we only know Adam and Eve because of the way they appear to Satan. 
this is something that's often missed in Paradise Lost, that when they first appear, they're described in this amazing way, this beautiful poetry quoted everywhere. Right? And I don't know if you believe, do you believe in you know, reading little pieces of poems? Do you believe in reading the whole thing? Are you a completist? Right? Do you read the whole thing? Do you read the whole of Shakespeare, Shakespearean play or the, the entire book? Or do you believe you know, little pieces are okay? Anyway, so here is the most famous part. To a far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect with native honor clad. Right? So right out of the Bible, they're naked. They're proud to be who they are. Uh, they don't realize they're naked, they're native honor clad, you know, their bodies are enough, they're honorable enough, they haven't learned shame yet. So it's straight out of Genesis, seems uncomplicated. But remember, this is Satan behind the tree, or bush, whatever, looking at them. And while he's looking at them, this is part of the whole puzzle of Satan, he falls in love with them. This is Satan, this is the most evil creature ever. He says, wow, I'm about to destroy them. I'm about to make them mortal. I'm going to trick them. But what a shame, because what glorious creatures they are. What amazing creatures these are. I and mean, this is an incredible part of Paradise Lost. So Satan becomes almost like a Shakespearean character. Now, Milton's writing after Shakespeare uh, in the sense that what he, when he does what he does, it's this psychological drama that goes on. He doesn't just do what he does. He's not like a hero out of Greek or Roman uh, writing where these heroes just do what they do, right? There's very little inner world, right? So um, he goes, to a far nobler shape, erect and tall. Far nobler than what? Far nobler than the animals. God-like erect, right? God-like, in other words, made in God's image. In naked majesty, seemed lords of all. And that's the first little darkness there. Seemed lords of all, right? Because remember, this is Satan seeing them. And worthy seemed. For in their looks, divine, the image of the glorious maker shown, right? Beautiful. Truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe, and pure, severe, but in true filial freedom placed. This is part of Milton's complicated philosophy of politics, that you can be free as long as you understand the authorities above you, right? So whence true authority in men, right? In other words, real authority comes from acknowledging the authority of God, and then once you know your position in the world, then you can confidently uh, express your authority in other ways. Though both not equal, as their sex not equal, the most amazing line ever. Because you might say, well, Milton is a, is a freaking, you know, sexist. He's saying the reason they're not equal is because they don't, they look different. <laughs> they're not equal, just like their sex doesn't is not equal, right? You look at them, they're like they look different, right? But there's that word seemed again, and it's through the eyes of Satan. So is Satan uh, fooled? Is Satan misled by the way they look? Not paying attention to what's inside of them, especially Wollstonecraft would say, what's inside of women, right? And then he goes on to a very classic patriarchal gender distinction based on how they look. And he says, for contemplation, he. In other words, man is made to think rationally. Man is rational, unlike woman. For contemplation, he and valor formed. In other words, for thinking and fighting. Thinking and battle, right? Valor and battle. For softness, she. Women are made to be soft, to be loved, to be cuddled. Uh, not to be out in the field, not to exercise, not to be martial, right? and sweet, attractive grace, in other words, to attract the attention of men. He forgot only, and she forgot in him. So not only are they gendered, but because of their gender, he gets to talk to God directly. She only gets to understand God through Adam. Lots of stuff here that obviously Wollstonecraft would not accept. So many problems with this. And yet it's complicated by the fact that Satan is saying it. And we have to wonder um, how that plays out. And Wollstonecraft will break this down beautifully in chapter two of A Vindication of the Rights of Women by really setting Milton's ideas against other ideas by Milton, right? Rather than setting his ideas against her principles, she says, let's take a look at two sections of Paradise Lost. Let's compare them and see maybe where he's a little confused about this. 
he, she doesn't do it in a, in, a, in a dismissive way because she mentions Milton many times in that book and in many other books of hers uh, as an important figure. He was actually an inspiration to a lot of the reformists and radicals of the time. Uh, there's a lot of other things he talked about, political works where he talked about the importance of having a balance against executive power, very important principle in Republican um, politics, Republican and in the sense of you know, um, having a, a representative body um, against the executive power. He talked about freedom of speech, one of the very earliest writers to talk about why it's so important to have dialogue with people you disagree with in a public area arena. So there's a lot of other things in Milton that she's not prepared to say, look, this guy's a, you know, he's just a patriarchal booby and that's it. Um, typically in Wollstonecraft, there's a very deep and considered intellectual engagement with these writers. Rousseau's a little harder because she's, she's really disturbed by his idea of education for girls. So she's a little harsher with him, a little harsher. But, but this is all going to be figured out when we take a look really closely at uh, Wollstonecraft and Milton. But in the meantime, let's just recap the idea of reputation, uh, the idea that, you know, should we be paying attention to cultural norms? Wollstonecraft, seen, uh, Hobbes says we have to because it's part of human nature. Uh, Rousseau says we don't have to, at least we shouldn't have to, uh, because it's not part of human nature. Uh, and Wollstone Press says, look, you know, uh, this will never go away, whether it comes from nature or not, it'll never go away. Uh, so we might as well um, channel our love of being loved, being accepted by people into things that are really valuable. Like, so let's be loved for, for, for things other than our outward appearance. And then we finally get to a reconsideration of Milton, where he grapples with this question too, and Wollstonecraft is gonna to have to go deeper into the whole question of um, appearance and gendering and things like that. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. By the way, my background is um, a fountain that was built in 1910 by uh, an ancestor of mine, uh, where a little trickle of water that they found in the mountains was enough to basically irrigate a farm that you know, uh, supported many families. So uh, another little historical thing I'm into. So uh, guys, thank you for listening, and I will I will see you next time. Write in the, write in the comments if you wanna if you wanna have a dialogue. Okay, guys, take care. Have have a great have a great time, a great season.